Well, good morning. I'm glad to be here before you today. Um, Whit is taking a vacation, you know, after he finished up that series, so the men could win. And the gist of it is, biblically, you know, when, when a male is, is following God and following the order that God has laid out through faith, his whole household can become aligned with that as well. Um, so Whit wanted to get us men right. And ladies, I'm happy to let you know that your time is coming. So, you know, but through, uh, through it all, we're supposed to, to get better and get closer to God and be better for one another. But today we're going to talk about one of our old biblical heroes, one of the fathers of the faith. We're going to talk about Noah. Um, and it's easy to have faith when there's things that you're used to or things that you know are, are going to happen. My son gets out of school at 320. So I know around 327, he's going to come walking out of the building. It doesn't take, you know, much faith to know that. Um, typically, Wick gets to the building around uh, 850. So I know that anywhere around that time, he's going to be pulling in in his truck. He'll probably be on the phone with somebody. But, uh, you know, that it doesn't take faith to know that. But Noah had to have faith in a time where there was a lot of wickedness and, and there was a lot of um, unnatural things going on. So it took faith to do what he did. So that's what we're going to talk about today, um, faith like Noah. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for everybody in this room under the sound of my voice. Lord, I ask you to bless them. I ask you to speak through me, Lord. Let your words come out and not mine, Father. You know what everyone came in here with, Lord. I just ask you to touch them right where they are. In your son's mighty name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. So before we really dive deep, I want to give you some interesting facts about Noah. Um, If you know me, you know I like history. I like apologetics. I like biblical history. I like Uh, the history of the world. I like science. I'm kind of a nerd in that way. So some real life things about Noah. Um, Noah was 500 years old when God told him to start building the ark. And if you don't know, the ark was a football stadium sized boat that God was going to use to save humanity Um, from the flood. So Noah was 500 real life years old when God um, told him to get started. Noah is 10th generation descendant from Adam. Um, So Adam, Adam's son, sons, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, The dimensions of the ark are 450 feet by 75 feet by 45 feet, 1.5 million feet cubed. It's enormous. It's hard to get a grasp of how big that is, but it's four stories high, bigger than a football field. It's an enormous undertaking um, that Noah was going to do because God spoke to him and he had faith enough to do it. It could fit 1,300 shipping containers. If you ever saw a shipping vessel, those um, containers that fit perfectly on the back of a semi, um, it can fit 1,300 of those. And it took 100 years to build. It took 100 years to build. Noah was 600 years old um, in the completion of the ark. Could you imagine that? 100 years, he had faith to do this. I know myself personally, sometimes my faith is, is, is short, like a, a week. You know, you prayed and, and you've asked God, Lord, Lord, help me with my kids. My son is about to be 13, so he's entering in a, a phase of, of life where uh, science says that all the chemicals and the hormones that are moving around in his brain, it causes them to temporarily lose their mind. We're, we're in that. So... I'll pray, Lord, help me with Christian, Lord. I don't want to go to jail, Father. Please, Lord, help me. Just help me. 
and things would be cool, like four days, four days, that fifth day, boom, he'll lose his mind, and I'm like, Lord, where are you? Where are you? I've lost faith. I'm back to my own devices, figuring out uh, how not to leave bruises and such, and so, or we'll say, we'll say, Lord, will you help me, Father? Help me with my marriage. Help me with my marriage, and what I mean is, Lord, fix Heather's attitude, Lord. Help her to stop Complain to Father, Lord, things will be smooth a week because I'll listen to him. Well, Daryl, you need to stop doing this. Then that's why she got an attitude. Boom, cool, Lord. Then seven days pass, right back to this. Lord, where have you gone? Outfit, people looking for jobs, looking for jobs. Lord, please help me find a job, Lord. I know I'm a felon. Lord says, I got you. Fill out some applications. Fill out two applications. It's four days later. Lord, where have you gone? No, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? We have to have a strong faith. We have to have a strong faith. Faith. And sometimes, you know, we've all been guilty of walking around in defeat before, like things aren't going our way, things aren't going according to our plan, and or we didn't listen to God and we did something contrary to the word of God, and, and so we walk around in defeat, like Adam and Eve. Who told God had to say, where are you, first of all? Who told you you were naked? They're walking around in defeat. God said, no, 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 I'll, I'll make a covering for you. You don't need to walk around in defeat. I'll make a covering for you. But what we do when things haven't gone our way for a while, we develop what I like to call a victim mentality, where the enemy makes it feel good for us to walk around feeling like a victim because we get a certain amount of attention from it. When God says, no, I'll cover you and you're, you're more than a conqueror and, and just have a little bit of faith and you can do this thing, but we walk around in defeat. We didn't start off like that. Yeah, Adam and Eve were grown um, when God put him in the garden and, and he made Eve out of, they were adults, but we didn't start off walking around defeat, in defeat as kids. Think about it. What does a, a toddler do when they start to pull up on the, the kitchen table or the, the coffee table? And then they, they take a couple steps, they fall. They, might, they may whine for a moment, but they get right up because innately they know, hey, that's temporary. I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to walk. And if they have an older brother or sister that's already running around, they're even faster at it because it's innate. You're a winner by nature. So they, they get up. They go again, they fall fine, but they took a couple more steps that time until they, they can run. But something about the world, as we get older, it takes pieces out of our faith. As things don't go our way or we have bad things happen to us, pieces of our faith, and we lose that, that childlike faith. But we got to keep that childlike faith. You know, we're going to talk about Noah. Let's look at Genesis 6. So this is a time, you know, it, it's, there were some differences between it and modern day, although we're not that far off from the wickedness. But the Bible says when human beings began to increase in number on earth, you know, God gave the command, be fruitful and plenty, multiply. Um, and human beings began to increase in number on earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. I'll break that down in a second. You have three. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal, and their days will be 120 years. Then verse 4 says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God, these are angels, went into the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were abominations. They were called the Nephilim. They were giants. They could do things that um, regular humans could not do. 
God's spirit, God's, God's heavenly beings were never supposed to fall and procreate with humans. But when those heavenly beings looked at God's beautiful creation and, and you know, as women, they said, we never saw nothing that beautiful. Let's go down there and, and procreate with them. And these were called heroes of old, men of renown. So, so they could do things. They were huge. They were giants. Um, Goliath was a Nephilim, a Philistine. They were an evil breed of giants. And so it was so much wickedness going on in the world um, in these days. But Genesis 6, 8 says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't it something how God always will find that one person? You could have a whole family Wickedness, wickedness. God won't destroy that family. God will find that one righteous person, that one righteous person to carry the torch, that one person who's willing to listen to God. Like in this time, Noah was considered, um, you know, weird because just like think about us, we're, we're called to walk a certain path while society is doing like this, rushing past us, telling us it's okay to do what you want, what you feel is, is what you should do, and, and we're called to walk against that path. And so Noah was a person who was walking against all the fornication that was going on. He was walking against the abominations. He was walking against the violence. You could do some research on what was going on in these days. It was pure wickedness. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked faithfully with God, and he knew God's voice. So God gives him what I like to call the instructions of faith. God tells him exactly how to build this ark. He told him the specifications. He told him to bring two of every unclean animal and seven of every clean animal. Why? Because they had to eat. Noah's family had to eat. The animals had to eat. So they had to bring more animals to, to feed one another. And here's the key part. Genesis 7, 5 says, And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him to do. He did all of it. What I like to do is I like to take a piece of what God told me to do and mix it with a piece of how I want to do it and then take a piece of the world and mix that all together and then get upset when it doesn't turn out like I wanted it to. But Noah did exactly what God had told him to do, exactly what God had told him to do. Adam and Eve, God gave the command, eat off these trees. These trees are beautiful, beautiful trees. Eat off of them. So they did that. They ate off of them. God said, but don't eat one of them. I love you, but if you eat this, you'll surely die. And then what do we do? Then we go and eat it. We're no different today. We dance around with sin the same way people did back then. And then we get upset with God when things don't turn out the way that we want them to turn out. When God gave us the instructions to follow, he gave us the instructions to follow. Noah did exactly what God told him to do. He and his family went into the ark after seven days and it began to rain. Noah had faith that God was telling him the right thing. He had belief that what God said was going to happen was going to happen. That takes faith. Noah believed when he had no sight or reference point. A lot of times we want God to show us the whole thing, show us why and, and, and how, but Noah didn't have a reference point. Up until that point, it had never rained. So God's got him building this huge boat. It had never rained. He had never seen a giant ark. 
He never told animals before to form a line. He never witnessed an apocalypse. And Noah lived 100 miles from the ocean, 100 miles from the nearest sea. So God says to this 500-year-old man, I need you to build this humongous boat right where you're at, 100 miles away from the sea. It had never rained. And if you didn't know this about Noah, don't judge him. Noah liked to have himself a little taste every now and again. He liked to drink a little bit. The first thing that he did when they got off of the ark is he built a vineyard and got drunk. So he liked to drink a little bit. Now, could you imagine you're a real human being? You're 500 years old. People know you like to drink a little bit. Here you are. You're building this humongous boat. And you told everybody, God told me to do this. This is real. They're like, God didn't tell Noah drunk again. He, y'all see what he's doing? He's drunk. That's what he's doing. He ain't going to rain. Where the rain going to come from? Water don't fall from the sky. At this time, water um, came from the ground. The earth was watered through the ground and through the water vapors in the air. Water didn't fall from the sky yet. So that's just drunk Noah. And could you imagine, Lord, you hear what they're saying about Just keep building. Keep building. Keep building. A hundred years. Keep building. Do you think we would have had that faith or would humanity have been lost? I know where I stand. The, <clears throat> the third or fourth time that I go drunk, Daryl, Lord, building that, you ain't, he ain't tell, I probably would have quit, but not Noah. Not Noah. Because, see, Noah had the dimensions. He heard God talk to him. I hear people sometimes say, well, I don't know, I... I I haven't heard from God, or God's not speaking to me, or I've never heard the audible voice of God. That's cool, because you have it right here. We have, we have the Bible more than any other nation on earth has the Bible. So we're without excuse. We can't say, I've never heard God speak. Open the pages and read and watch God speak to you. And you've even heard God speak in those moments where you're getting ready to make the wrong decision, and you hear a still small voice say, don't do that. That's not going to turn out right. And you might still do it anyway, but at least you were told it's not going to turn out right. So when it does it, you know God already spoke. But the more you get into the pages of this book, the more you'll be able to hear God's voice. John 10, 27 says this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they followed me. Noah knew God was talking to him because he walked with God. He had a relationship with God. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. We had a big um, chocolate lab named Reese, right? Reese was my dog. Reese knew my voice. Reese knew my voice so much that She knew when I meant business and when I was just playing. Why? Because Reese walked with me every day. I can't call somebody else's dog. They're not going to come because I'm not their owner. But Reese could be way down the street. And if I said her voice, she knew, hey, that's my owner. That's the guy who feeds me. I better start running towards him. Noah knew God's voice. So I tell people all the time, if you feel like you haven't heard God's voice in a while, are you walking with him? Are you in relationship with him? Are you reading your word? <coughs> Excuse me. Are you studying? Because there's no way you're going to hear God's voice if you're not in relationship with him. It doesn't work like that. And God is a gentleman. He's not going to bulldoze his, his way in. No, he wants to be in relationship with you. That means he wants to walk with you. And when you do that, you'll hear his voice. You'll feel him. You'll feel his presence in in those times of need. Um, So if you've never heard God's voice, get in your Bible. Get in relationship with him. And it may not be a big boastful sound from the heavens. It it might be a still small voice. It might be a a feeling of, of caution. But he's with you. He's walking with you. 
At this time, he never seen a flood. He never seen a flood because there was no need for a flood to happen until then. So could you, could you imagine you're sitting there <clears throat> doing your, your good Christian things like we do every morning? You could either you wake up, you're, you're reading your words, you're reading your Bible, or you're, you're in the garage. For some of you, um, you're working on your, your, your mowers, you're working on your, your machines, getting ready to start the day, doing things like you, you normally do. And then, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Okay, I'm 500, I know my hearing. My, okay, that's, that's God. Okay, Lord, I, I'm, I hear you, Lord, but I don't know if you got the right guy. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and cut it with pitch, inside and out. Um, I, I got some young sons that might be strong enough to do that, Lord. I, I know I hear you, but I, I don't know if you got the right, the right one of us. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Okay, okay, Lord, I, I know it's your voice. I know you're telling me to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but, but I'm listening, Lord. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. Okay, Lord, well, if you said it, Lord, then, then I believe you. And then Noah got up every single day for 100 years and grabbed his axe and went out and cut wood, got pitch and built every single day for 100 years of faith. That's crazy faith. That's extreme faith. A hundred years he did that. We know this. A lack of faith can make us angry. If you struggle with um, anger issues, it could be as simple as a lack of faith. You don't believe that it's going to get better. You don't believe that God's going to do what he said he would do. And what that does is that makes us then angry on the inside because we feel like we don't have any hope. We feel like it's not going to get better. But we have to be, we're people of faith. I remember the first time Heather got cancer and um, she was in the, the first, I walked into the room and I thought when I walked onto uh, the cancer unit at Sarah Bush, I thought I was going to walk into like a room of death. Like a, a, a room of people, Siri, this is big business we're talking about here. A room of people dying. And when I walked in there, it was a room of life. And, and somebody would speak to Heather and they would just be cheerful, the nurses. And Heather would speak a word to somebody. Some people in there were depressed. Some people's family had never heard the gospel. And she would get a chance to speak a word. And all of a sudden, it became a place of life. And I say, okay, Lord, well, what, what am I supposed to do? Because I, I don't know. I'm not a, a scientist. I don't know how medicine works. What, what do you need me to do? Just make her comfortable. On the days when she can't get out of bed, just make her comfortable. Okay, Lord, I believe you said she's going to be healed. Cool, that's what I'm going to do those days, make her comfortable. I'm not going to let her hear me screaming at the kids. Lord, I'm just going to let her rest. God heals her. Then she gets sick again. Okay, Lord, I I, I believe she's going to be healed because you said it. So what do you want me to do? Do the same thing again. See, in those moments where we have to completely trust God, We have to completely trust God. We got to ask him, well, what do you want us to do in those moments? Is there some work that that you need us to to do? Is there there things that you want me to be learning in the meantime? Because in the meantime is where we mess up at because we get distracted. Imagine if in those hundred years, 
Noah got distracted. And trust me, during those hundred years, he was distracted. I'm sure that there was things that, that he wanted to do that were contrary to building that boat every day. Every day. But he stayed focused. He knew he heard from God, and he stayed focused. What happens when we take our eyes off of God and we, we, we try to do things, you know, with our own hands is we mess things up. We mess things up. So if you heard the story about Abram and his wife Sarah or Sarai, depending on, on the time in Scripture. So what happened was God told them that they were going to have, uh, have a child. Let's look at Genesis 17, 16. This is what God says. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had father. This is Father Abraham and his wife. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. So they were gonna, he was going to be the father of many nations through his wife. Okay? So in Genesis 16, 2, this is what happens. So at this point, she doesn't have faith. She doesn't, she doesn't believe it. She's 80 years old. So it's going to take a miracle for, from God for this to happen. She's 80. She says to her husband, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave and perhaps I can build a family through her. So she gives her husband her um, Egyptian slave, Hagar, and her husband sleeps with Hagar and has a child. Sarah then gets upset and then blames him for her misery. That's what we do when we don't follow the instructions that God has laid out for us and we take matters into our own hands and it goes bad, we blame everybody else but the person who didn't listen to God, ourselves ourselves. We have to listen to the commands that God has laid out before us. A lack of faith causes us to try to force God's hand. And every time we try to force God's hand, it's not going to go right. It might be successful for a moment. It might not be successful at all. It might end in sin. It might blow up in our face. And reason being is because God can see the end from the beginning. So while I think something's a good thing and, and by all natural standards it might be a good thing, God can see what's going to happen in the end of that thing. And it might not be a good thing. So that's why we are supposed to follow God's instructions and have faith that he's going to fulfill the things that he tells us that he will. I hear a lot of people Believers say, I'm believing God to do this. I'm believing God to do that. But then their, their earthly walk is a sinful walk. But, but they want God to bless what, they want God to come alongside and bless that sin. But God will never do that. God will never step in and bless your sin. He won't align with that, especially when he's already given us the instructions. And again, people will say, I haven't heard God say anything about this. I haven't heard God speak to this area. Have you been reading your word? Have you done your research? Have you tried to find it? Because a lot of times what we do is we'll form an opinion. And, I, and I've even seen preachers do this. We'll form an opinion in our mind of what we want God to think or say, and then we'll go research to find out how we're right. We want, we want to find out how what we said was right or how our thought process was right. And if you go looking for things with that frame of mind, you'll always find it. You'll always find it. You'll always be able to rationalize the scripture to mean what you want it to mean. The only way to truly know is to look at the, the scriptures 
without your own personal opinion and just be able to hear God's voice. But again, to do that, you have to be walking with God, and he'll speak to you. We got to do exactly what he tells us to do. Let's look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. I know heaven is there. I know heaven can't be compared to anything that my human eyes have ever seen. I know that there's no more tears, there's no more crying in heaven. I know all these things. I know it's beautiful. I know there's, there's streets of gold there, but I can't see it. But my hope that I'm given lets me know that it's there, but I can't physically see it. But my faith in God and the fact that he can't lie lets me know that. We have to be people of faith. We have to be people who walk according to the word, believing that it's true. When we can't see the results right away, <clears throat> we have to believe that God knows what's best for us. And there's some things that, that I wish I could do, that I wish God didn't say, Daryl, you can't do that. Of course, of course. But I have to trust that God knows what's best for my human life here on earth. And believe him. I have to believe that he said, when he says, Daryl, you're more than a conqueror, that I am. I have to believe when he says, Daryl, you can do all things through Christ. I have to believe that I can do that. And when I do that, that makes me shake that victim mentality of what happened to me when I was a kid or, or how I was wronged in this area of life or how I was church hurt in 1998. So, you know, I'm able to shake those things because, wait a minute, I have faith that God's telling the truth. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have to believe that. We have to believe that. When you believe in something, it profoundly affects your actions. That's fact. When you believe in something, good or bad, it profoundly affects your actions. If I told my son, hey, your birthday is March 25th, and we're going to uh, elevate Trampoline Park, what then does that kid do? That kid believes you. They start making invitations. They go to school. Hey, we're going to elevate Trampoline Park. It's my birthday. My dad said we're going, so we're going. He don't care if it's a snowstorm that day. I better put it in four-wheel drive because dad said we're going. He don't care Oh, your little brother got sick? Cool, dad, drop him off at grandma's because we're going. We have to have that childlike faith. If God said it, we have to believe it and walk accordingly. When we walk around with the victim mentality and, and faithlessness, we're saying, God, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. But when we walk around with, hey, God, you've said it. I believe it. You feel differently. And we all have walked around in defeat. There's something that you've been through that you're holding on to that, that God wants to release you from because his, his burden is light. He wants to release you from that heavy yoke that you're carrying. But we have to have faith. There's so many dreams when was the last time you dreamt something and it made you giddy like a kid and you wanted to tell people, yo, I think I'm, I'm going to, but you can't tell people because you, you don't know if, if, if you're supposed to tell about it yet, but you just got this feeling inside you. When was the last time you had that kind of excitement and that kind of joy and that kind of faith that God was going to do something big in your life? When was the last time you dreamt something and you felt it down in your core and you're believing God for it? Or are you, are you, are you in defeat where you, where you feel like your best days have come and gone? God didn't say that. Noah was 500. I don't think nobody in this room is 500. Not even close. Not even close. But when was the last time you, you felt like that? When was the last time you could recall feeling like that? that? That dream inside of you. And Noah did something 
Once he got the vision from God, once God gave him the instructions, he did something that we don't do. He got after it. He still had to chop some trees down. There was still a process. There was still a process, and he went through that process. And some days his hands hurt. Some days he probably had a headache. Some days his, his kids got on his nerves. Some days his wife got on his nerves. Some days he got on their nerves. But he kept doing it. He kept believing God. He kept believing God. And he and his family went in. God closed the door, closed the window. God sealed it up. And now they're on there. Seven days go by. God has sealed it. Boom. Seven days go by. And all of a sudden they hear, do, 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 do. What is that? Now it's raining. Now it's raining. See, it's only crazy until it starts to rain. What God has for your life may sound like foolishness to somebody else. Girl, you're going to get sober. You're going to get clean. You're going to buy a house one day. You're going to be in ministry one day. You're going to get that degree. You're going to be a great father. You're going to be a great mother. It might sound like foolishness to people who know you in the natural until it starts to rain. Until it starts to rain. You're going to overcome that thing. We walk around in defeat. Ah, I failed so many times, Lord. So what? So what? God gives us an example. God always gives us an example. Jesus is on the cross. He doesn't deserve to be there. He's there next to criminals. God says, Lord, I deserve this mess. I deserve this death penalty because I've been doing bogus stuff my whole life. But you, you, didn't, you don't deserve this. You're, you're Jesus. You're the king of kings. I believe you're who you say you are. Life of crime. Jesus says, on this day, you'll be with me in paradise. Forget everything that you did up until this point. On this day, you'll be with me in paradise. In paradise. There's a struggle that you have. You've been fighting with it all your life. You've been fighting with this thing. You've been dealing with this thing. Your faith comes and goes. You ask the Lord to take it, but then you take it back from him. Because you're fighting with the weapons of the world. You're not, you're not called to fight with the weapons of the world. You're called to fight with weapons of faith. You're called to fight with prayer and fasting and faith to pull down those strongholds that have you in the place that you feel like you can't get out of. God frees you from that. He frees you from that. And we've all been through it. It takes faith. It takes faith to make it in a world where, where we get so much pushback. The world would like you to feel trapped in the moment that you're in. But faith allows you to do something for God and be steadfast for 100 years until it starts to rain. Jesus himself can free you from that. I want to give you an opportunity if you have never accepted and confessed your faith in Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity right now. He said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Not we'll see how you do. Not we'll see if you can know this day. They were about to die this day. And that gift is afforded to you if you believe on him, if you confess. And we want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to pray with you. And if you believe that, if you believe he's Lord, I'm asking you to pray with me and receive him. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, Lord. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross. I believe on the third day you rose with the keys to death and Hades in your hand. I believe that you took the punishment that I deserve. And you saved me from hell if I believe on you. I want to make you the Lord of my life today. Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart and clean me, change me from the inside out. I make you on this day Lord of my life. I believe in you. My faith is in you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.